and get used to hearing no, because it's going to happen all the time. <laughs> get used to hearing <laughs> no. And just like be loyal enough to yourself to like keep going and be patient and to do the work necessary and know that it's going to take longer than you think it is. But that doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. It just means that you need to give yourself more time. So I think also, I think like I essentially was seen less, but made a lot more just because the things I did say yes to paid me a lot more because I was really clear on like, I'm really only interested in working with you because you actually care about my audience and you actually are aware of the kind of brand MaddieJames.com is. Hey, this is Raina Campbell, your chief dream driver, and welcome to the No Parking Podcast, where through conversations and discussions with creators like yourself, we'll find interesting approaches to help you take your dreams out of park, put them in drive, and ride towards success. Hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 127 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. And I'm so excited for you guys to hear from our guest today, Maddie James. And Maddie is the creator of MaddieJames.com. And since 2010, she has worked with brands such as Google, Macy's, Cotton, H&M, and many more. She has a community of over 175,000 lifestyle enthusiasts. And her brand includes a blog, two podcasts, a newsletter, a YouTube channel, and a variety of physical and digital products and I wanted to have Maddie on today to really talk about um, this idea of momentum what does it take to truly produce results in your business and brand and especially if you're an influencer how can you do this and how can you actually reach those goals that you've set for yourself this year so on this episode we're going to really zero in on Maddie's keys to building an audience the art of hustling profitable revenue models and her favorite networking and relationship building tips. So get ready for that. If you want today's show notes, just go to dreamsanddrive.com and click on episode 127. And if you want to subscribe to our podcast, wherever you're listening, whether it be Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, Our Heart Radio, just do so. Hit that subscribe button. And it's really good because you'll get notifications every time we have a new episode. And if you haven't been following me on social or you're not part of our online newsletter, you may not know this, but we have Dreams and Drive merchandise for sale so right now we are selling dreams and drive t-shirts and they're only ten dollars right now so if you want to order a dreams and drive t-shirt the easiest way to do so is just to email me reina at dreams and drive.com or send me a message on instagram at dreams and drive and we have t-shirts in red black and gray available in sizes small to extra large so if you want to order a shirt that's the way to do it email me or send me a message on social we are doing a giveaway of the week, and this week we are actually teaming up with one of our dream drivers. I put out a call on Instagram the other day. I said, hey, you know, if you guys want to collaborate with Dreams and Drive, hit me up. And Yoga with Kiara hit me up. Kiara Butler, who is a yoga instructor based out of Kansas City, Missouri, she hit me up. And we're going to be giving away one of her Got Yoga merchandise. So you can either win a Got Yoga crop top or a Got Yoga tank top and uh, all you have to do is just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win that's dreamsanddrive.com slash win to enter and yoga with Kiara's objective is to teach the community holistic training and healing through yoga and education in order to assist in the major issues affecting today's society so definitely go check her out and make sure to enter the contest this week and remember, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So if you're not following us, just go search Dreams and Drive, hit follow, and make sure we're connected. I can't wait for you guys to hear this episode. Enjoy. Hi, Raina. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. This has been, um, you have been on my list of people that I would love to have on the show for a long time. So I feel like it's just been, it's, it's so fun when you build a vision and you, feel, you build a brand and your dreams come true literally as you get to have the guests that you've always dreamed of having on the show. So thank you so much for being on today's episode. <laughs> no problem. I'm, I'm excited for this. So let's go back in time. As our listeners know, I love to ask our guests this same question, the way we start off each show. Is what inspired you as a child? So if I had to say, you know, who was Maddie, the the eight-year-old, the nine-year-old, how would you describe yourself? 
I was very much so like my daughter now. So I was very extra, just very active, <laughs> very talkative, very dramatic. And I just really loved for the things I did to feel like a performance. So even if it was a book report um, or, you know, writing my first book, you know, we, we used to do this thing at my elementary school starting in second grade. We would publish a book every year. You know, we'd like work on a story and do our own illustrations. And um, it was just funny to me because I just like really made that like this big dramatic thing. And, and now that I'm saying it out loud, it's actually reminding me of my daughter. Now my, my daughter always says like, she has these super dramatic dreams. Like mom, there was a monster, but then Spider-Man came and saved me. And I'm always looking at her crazy. But now that I say it out loud, my very first book that I wrote was, like, me going to, like, Dracula's house. And, like, he was giving me a tour. <laughs> and, and it was just like, what is this crazy imagination? But that's really what it was all about. It was about imagination and really, um, and really me just utilizing that. And, and, I, and I think that's gone with me as I've turned in, as I've grown into an adult. But, yeah, I think those are the things that excited me. I just love performance. I, I mean, I was obsessed with Janet Jackson and Michael and, and all of those things. Were we performance all? really, okay. yeah. Um, and there was just something about performance that was just so appealing to me. Um, so I think that was pretty much it, you know, like I just, was a very, very much extroverted kid um, and became an extroverted adult. So I, I think it's been pretty consistent since I was a kid. What was the dream back then? How do you think that evolved into figuring out like what you wanted to do? Well, I knew I always wanted to be a performer. So I remember like, you know, like writing songs growing up and singing and dancing and cheerleading, like, and I did pageants. And so I was always in things that like uh, it required me to be on stage. And I remember when I was 16, about to start my senior year, I had like a private conversation with my mom. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to college because I'm going to go to New York and be a star. And she's like, yeah, yeah, don't let your father hear that. Uh, and she just kind of like, you know, she kind of, you know, she brushed it off and not just, I don't think because she didn't believe in me, but I think for her, especially because my parents are immigrants, they, it was really important to them that I went to school and, and had that opportunity. You know what I mean? That, um, I, I guess like the American dream kind of family always had because that's why they moved to this country for us to have those opportunities. So it definitely wasn't from a place of like disrespect or uh, intentional disregard. But for me, it was just like, I know where I'm supposed to be. And so I did go to school, but I dropped out of school in junior year and I moved to New York and I did in fact pursue music and different things like that. But I, I think, you know, now that I'm looking back at it, it was, it was about being really true and authentic to myself. Um, and even mm. if that meant I have to, I had to fall flat on my face, uh, I was willing to do that. Why the decision to drop out? Um, it just wasn't serving me. I just wasn't challenged. And when I'm in situations where it's too easy, um, I think what happens is I get easily distracted. And then I don't perform my best because I'm not in the situation that is pushing me to do my best. You know, when things become easy, I'll start out and I'll do really well, right? So I'll start getting mm -hmm. good grades and stuff like that. But then if it's not challenging me or, you know, really pushing me to think in a different way, what will happen is I'll get bored. And this is something that's literally since I was a child, I would start to procrastinate or I would start to, you know, talk too much or do other things. And, and so I do need to be challenged. And I think that's why I think motherhood and entrepreneurship and marriage mixed in one general of uh, my life <laughs> is perfect because I do have to be challenged for me to stay intrigued and interested in something and, and want to perform better. Did making the leap help you help put you onto the path of figuring out what it was that you wanted to do with your life at that age? Because I know how it was to just be you know, a junior in college and just trying to figure things out. So take us back to what you were thinking and doing during that time to do so. It was just like I wanted more and, you know, your parents really do influence you, like whether you want to admit it or not, right? So your parents have this like direct influence on you. And for my parents, it was all about education. So even if it wasn't like traditional education, quote unquote, like my mom went to cos cosmetology school, my dad went to undergrad and went to, you know, grad school at the Ohio State. So for them, it was just like, you know, getting a traditional education. And I think for me, I'm a really... Um, active 
perspective person. I think the, not only my imagination, but I think even for me, I learn better when I'm hands on and I can make the mistake and learn from the experience. And a four year college uh, experience doesn't necessarily always allow you to do that. You know, um, for me to learn how to speak in front of people, I need to speak and I need to, you know, I need to suck at that. And then you need to give me a critique and not every classroom situation is built like that. There were some like that, but the majority of them were not like that. And so for me, I was just like, well, what would challenge me? What would just like completely disrupt the situation? And for me, I I consider myself a disruptor. And so I need to be disrupted when I am learning. So it actually sticks with me. And that was pretty much it. It was like, okay, you could actually like stop and you could go to New York City with the $400 to your name from working your part-time job while you're at school. And yeah, there's nothing more disruptive than that because I think like my parents have always been there for me and always financially been there for me. So for me to leave school, my dad cut me off financially. And he was like, listen, you know, I, I want everything to go well for you in New York. But, like, if you're not going to school and we're paying for school, then, you know, we can't help you in that instance. And I think it just really forced me. It was like it was like being in between a rock and a hard place, right? It just, like, really forced me to rise to the occasion because I, you know, I was pretty much like I, – I, I, was, I literally had to put um, the, my money where my mouth was, right? So it was kind of like, oh, you don't want to go to school. You want to be a performer, go do that. And I think, you know, nothing, nothing teaches you about your work ethic and your actual hustle more than moving to New York city broke. And, oh my gosh. Um, yes. I mean, I haven't done it. So I guess that means. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I feel like it just was like, okay. It was like a rude awakening. It was like, okay, we're going, uh, we're going to New York. I took everything that I owned, you know, which wasn't much, you know, I was 21 Um, so it was just like, all right, I got my little suitcase. I got my little $400. We had a um, family friend who lived in New York, um, and they lived in the projects, but I went, you know, it was like, it was already like five or six people living in this one bedroom. I made it seven. So I really, really, and I left my parents, you know, 3,500 square foot house, you know, like with all the amenities you could think of, you know, cause my mom just was just so awesome at making sure we never had to worry for anything. So, yeah, so, but for me, it was like, I I wasn't interested in, um, like, surviving in this bubble for the sake of saying that I did something because everybody else was comfortable with it. Um, And so, yeah, I I definitely think, like, there there could have been a couple of decisions that uh, I I made, like, a traditional, like, the typical 21-year-old. But for me, it was just like, you know what, I'm proving to you that this is what I really want to do. School is not for me, and that's fine but I'm willing to work to figure out what is for me. During that time in New York, what do you think was the, like, the biggest thing you learned about what it really takes to hustle and make it? Because I know you're not in New York now, so maybe mm-hmm. tell us that story about, like, what, what was that lesson for you there? Um, just that it's way harder. Anything that you want is way harder than you think it is. <laughs> it's just like way harder and it takes you way longer. So it was like those two things. It's like one, it's super, super hard. And two, it's going to take longer than you ever imagine. So, um, and I don't say that to be discouraging to anybody, but if you think that you're so good that, you know, it's going to happen for you in a year, you know, like you should expect for it to like happen for you, like more like 36 months. Um, as far as even just like leveling up, not even like quote unquote, making it per se, um, just because it does take a while. There's one, you're not the only person who has this dream. You're not the only person who thinks they can do it. Um, and so you really do one, you have to pay your dues, you know, you have to be willing to, um, intern or shadow people or, you know, uh, just meet people and network and stuff like that. And you, you really do have to, if you, you have to mean what you say and say what you mean, you know, because it's, it's going to be really discouraging. You're going to have days where it's super hard, where it seems impossible, but you need to keep going. And so that's really what, um, that's really what New York taught me. I, I it just really kind of gave me those in your face lessons that I think my parents were trying to kind of uh, protect me from, but it mm-hmm. was really, really good for me in the long run, especially like as I became a business owner. I think immigrant parents love to teach their kids lessons. Cause my parents are Jamaican. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There, like, it's like, you know, I remember when I was, when my sister and I were young and 
it's so funny thinking about it now, but we really wanted Cartoon Network, right? But Cartoon Network <laughs> was like an addition. You know how cable packages used to be? Yep, yep. Have, like, oh, girl, I know, I know that Cartoon Network uh, package. It was definitely yes. more expensive than the regular package. We wanted that. And my parents were like, all right, well, you guys get a monthly or a weekly allowance. Are you willing to part with, uh, maybe it was like $2 out of your allowance every week. And we had to do this long and hard thought, like, hmm, (laughs) you know what? We could watch Cartoon Network at Grandma's house on Saturdays and Sundays. But it's so important, those things that our parents teach us that we sometimes realize later. Because now I think I'm able to, you know, not like, I don't, I realize there's things we need versus things that we want. And that you don't always mm, have mm-hmm. to, you don't always need those things that you want. And there's a time and place for when you can actually get it. And it won't be like a, you know, it won't break your budget, which is something we learned as like 10 year olds. But um, thinking about, um, you, you're known, Maddie, for just your fabulous like online blogging, online coaching, all that stuff. Like, how did you get interested in the online world? Because you said you went to New York to become a performer. So what, when did that transition happen for you? Well, I think the thing is, is, you know, I'm, I'm a Gemini, you know, I think by nature and, and of course my birthday. So, um, I think I've always had like a twofold love. So I've always wanted to perform, but I think I've always loved and just naturally had an inkling for writing. Um, once the music thing for me, like I really started to understand and find out how the industry worked, I blogging became the thing that happened on the scene. And I had moved back to, I moved to Atlanta after uh, living in New York for a year because um, my grandfather had fallen ill. So I wanted to be close to family. And, you know, I had learned about this blogging thing and that became fascinating to me as I was working like my part-time retail gigs and, when I started seeing like how they worked, I was like, Oh, I can do this. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. uh, again, lo and behold, I can do this, but it's a lot harder and it's going to take a lot longer than you think. Yeah. I've always loved writing. You know what I mean? Like I was the sports editor of my high school newspaper when I was a senior. Um, and I was the first female student to, to do that at my high school. Um, you know, I've been, you know, I had published quote unquote, my first book, in second grade and the writing had always been something that was a part of me. I always kept a journal. I always kept a diary. Like writing was really that, that crazy imagination that I was telling you that I had when I was eight allowed me to, uh, writing allowed me to kind of get that imagination out without keeping it bottled inside. And even mm-hmm. like as I uh, graduated high school and even went into college, I would write these movie scripts, you know, I'd, I would want these stories to become movies and, and, all, and all of that. So writing was always a part of my life. Um, but being able to do it in this cool way online, either on like a daily or weekly basis um, was fascinating to me. And so I, I did it. I started it as a hobby in 2008. Once I won Miss Liberia USA in 2009, I had a lot more eyes on me. So in 2010, I was like, well, let me get serious and buy my domain. So when I was doing it in 2008, it was on a very hobby level. There was no level of consistency or, and there was really no goal of like making money because at that point, I didn't really even understand how you can make money online, Mm -hmm. especially through blogging. But by 2010, it started becoming a little bit more apparent. You could work with brands and different things like that. So in 2010, I bought the domain and uh, started getting a lot more serious and consistent about it. And at first, I didn't really know what I was doing, just like most people when they first start out. I I thought I needed to talk about celebrity style since um, style was my thing. But I think people were eventually, I realized people were interested in my voice and my perspective, you know, on things, whether I wear the kind of makeup I was into or anything like that. And so slowly but surely, I started sharing that more and more and getting consistent with that and and learning how to become a strong online storyteller. That is so amazing. I just think that a lot of us don't realize just Think about the evolution to that point, right? You you learned a lesson, then you moved back to Atlanta, then you were discovering and reigniting that love for, for writing, and, and you built this online platform, Mattyology. Do you remember what it was like when you started to realize, wow, people like what I'm posting? Maybe there's, maybe there's something I could build even further than what I ever thought. It was really, I think, probably about a year into um, when I created my first blog, Mattyology. It was really like 
Oh, what had happened was I had entered a contest, a blogging contest at the end of uh, 2010, and it was called Full-Time Fabulous. It was um, actually created by Sunglass Hut, and they were looking for, like, the next big fashion blogger. And the winner was going to get $100,000, and they were going to give them a $1,000 monthly shopping um, allowance, and they were going to, you know, pretty much sponsor their life for a year where they would live in the brand new W at the time in the financial district. So I was like, oh, yeah, who doesn't want that? You know, I was a newlywed. <laughs> we didn't have any kids. I was like, yeah, we'll make a life work in New York. Like my husband was like, yeah, Yo, you have to do this. Like you could totally, you could totally win something like this. So I had to do like a 60 second video. So I did the 60 second video. I Long story short, I didn't win, but I became a top 10 finalist, and that really taught me how to interact with brands. It definitely gave me a push in, like, my social media following because of, like, the uh, visibility um, that I was getting. And during that um, contest for 30 days, and we had a blog about our personal style, so I could not lean on celebrities. And so I started sharing about, like, how to – three ways to wear a dress and, you know, mm-hmm. like, my favorite lipstick for the holidays and, and different things like that because it was in December of 2010. What I realized was um, when I would check the analytics of those posts – people really resonated when I was talking about my personal experiences with the product or what I did versus just talking about cool sunglasses or, you know, um, something that wasn't attached to my story. And so that's when I realized like, Oh, what people care about is the narrative of me, this normal and approachable person having these experiences with products that they already do like, but how I interpret that or use it in my life. I know that I'm going to fast forward. We could definitely we could definitely go through your story a lot more in depth, but I really want to get into the tips that you have for our listeners today. You got let go from a job, right? And it kind of sprung mm-hmm. you into blogging full time where you started to realize, okay, how can I make this passion of mine a business? Can you walk us through those first few months of how you were able to set up your brand so that you were able to to build revenue and build out your services and what you were going to offer to the world now that you're doing it full time? In the beginning of Mattyology, I wasn't working because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to become a full time blogger and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Again, it takes way longer than you think. Um, so, yeah, I didn't make money for the first three years of me blogging. So I got like a nine to five because I wasn't working at the time. Um, you know, my husband was like, go, go for your dreams. So I was very blessed to be in a situation where I had a spouse that was supportive. Started working in at the end of 2011 um, and worked this job for about three and a half years, and I got let go in the summer of 2015. Now, by 2013, I had started making pretty consistent money from mm-hmm. blogging, but wasn't taking that seriously. Would blow it off on clothes and makeup and different things like that. When I had my daughter in 2014, we had really gotten to a place where it was like, whoa, we could actually like, you could actually like leave your job. But it was something that I was really apprehensive about just because I just had a little bit of guilt, especially now that I have become a parent, you know, to leave my quote unquote good job to, you know, fulfill my dream of making my blog my business. Um, But in 2014, um, I just had like a, there was just something that happened to me that kind of carried out in 2015. There was just like a motivation I think that because I was a mother, that I was even more determined and motivated than ever. So long story short, 2015 was probably just like when I really realized that I could do it. And it was funny because I was like, okay, I think I'm going to quit. I'll quit in September. I'll quit in July. And it happened in June. So it was kind of like, okay, well, now you actually have to (laughs) put 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 the money where your mouth is, you know? And for me, it was... uh, it was a very transitional year because uh, the top of 2015 was like the first time that I had gone into webinars and more of that like in, an infopreneur type of blogging. Um, you know, beforehand I had really just been doing style blogging and a little bit of YouTubing and stuff like that. 2015, I also started to dabble in podcasting as well. So for me, it, it really opened up my eyes on all these different areas that I could establish in my brand um, as a blogger. And when I got let go, I, I literally just was like, okay, this means it's go time. And my assistant at the time, who now runs my operations on a day-to-day basis, she just, we just figured it out. We figured out how I could get a, 
uh, an, an ounce of post out every day, how we could get a podcast out five, five times a week. We just like really, you know, put the pedal to the metal and, you know, just, it, it really was, it, it really wasn't overnight, you know, like, like I said, I had been making money since 2014, but I think the motivation behind it, um, and even like me believing in myself because it now was a reality definitely helped me. And so it definitely helped build my confidence, which I think, um, was shown in my, my consistency and yeah, it was just great. And I really did also feel like a connection to my audience that I had not really ever felt before. So that was a really great part of my career for sure. What were you doing to make sure that you were increasing your visibility and bringing in new people who hadn't who hadn't known about who what you were doing in your your blog and your brand? We just posted every day, you know what I mean, and just like my 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 counter yeah my counterpart like most people don't have the discipline and um, the commitment to do that, you know what I mean? So it was just like yeah, like the person if you're willing to do the work every day, you know somebody new will find you. Especially like not only was it like posting content on the blog. We were like promoting me every day, like on every channel. So on Twitter, we were putting out 20 to 30 promo tweets, you know what I mean? With very specific copy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we still do about like 20, we we do about like 20 to 25 uh, promotional tweets a day, like Monday through Friday. Yeah. With copy and stuff like that. We were doing Pinterest. We still didn't really know how to use Pinterest back then, but we were like pinned every now and again, but I was very consistent on Pinterest, which is why I have like 13,000 followers on there. And I think a lot of people underutilize Pinterest. And for me in 2018, I'm living on Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube. Like if you want to be visible, those are the platforms that you, that you really pour your energy into. But yeah, we were very consistent, not only with the content creation, but with the content promotion. And I think that's what allowed me to become a lot more visible. And I really did maximize um, Periscope live video and the live Live video thing just live video will always open you to a new audience. You know, it's like one of those things like people share live video when they see live video, they want to see what's going on, you know, just because people are naturally inquisitive. And so that's how I did it, you know, and I, and I was periscoping for about like three, four months there. I was periscoping about four to five times a day, a, a week. Um, I remember so yeah. that. I, mm-hmm. I love that. And then sometimes you would bring in your sister and you guys would mm-hmm. do stuff together. I re- and it's so funny because Periscope was before, you know, Instagram Live. Even Was it before mm-hmm. Facebook Live? Was it the first yeah, it was before Instagram Live and Facebook Live. So thinking about that, you talked about consistency. And I think a lot of us dream drivers, we want to be more consistent. But I'm a big believer is you can't, you can't be consistent without knowing what you want to be consistent and what your goals are. And I know just by going on your site now, which you rebranded to MaddieJames.com, you're a mm-hmm. big believer in processes and systems and having a plan. And I'm actually looking at your style blogger business plan. Um, in front of me, which is something we can link to because I think it's a great resource and you can definitely use it if, um, even if you're not a style blogger, just to outline and definitely apply it to whatever you're doing. How did you figure out what your, like, what was your approach to developing the plan for your business? Well, I just had to get really clear on what I wanted. And, and mm-hmm. I think being a blogger is part of my, my journey, but it isn't the journey. It's part of it. You know what I mean? It isn't the entire journey. Um, I know that I want to get into uh, physical products, not just info products. I know that I, um, you know, my ultimate goal is to become uh, like an international like talk show host. Like, you know, and for me, I, I was interested in you knowing me as the personality and the brand more than Mattyology, the blog. And so for me, I was like, okay, well, that means I need to go by my name. You guys need to know me as the person. Um, and and it, to me, it just was like a growth matter because I think with Mattyology, it was something that I could kind of hide behind um, mm-hmm. because it was kind of like a screen name, you know what I mean? Um, and so for me, it was like, I don't need to hide anymore. Like I'm valuable enough. I'm confident enough in my skill and my value that I can just go by my name. For me, I also believe that Mattyology was very style and beauty focused. And I think as I'm growing, MattyJames.com is more of like an overall lifestyle um, site. Like I think people are not only interested in, you know, maybe what I wear as far as like lipstick or shoes or anything like that, but I think people are interested in how I run my life. You know what I mean? How do I balance marriage and motherhood 
along with running my business. You know what I mean? Like, oh, what do me and my sister like to do if we're not working on our businesses? I think people are interested in that narrative. And to be quite honest, I think just like consumers and readers and followers are just a lot more smarter than they were um, eight years ago. And so for me, I felt like saying Mattyology would have been doing them a disservice. There's just so much more. Um, and, and that's what we're tapping into as we go into 2018, you know. Um, there'll be some more changes um, before I go on maternity leave. But, yeah, I just think that for me I had to think about my my – ran from a 360 standpoint, and I think, like, Mattyology only allowed me to do it on a 180 standpoint. What was the challenge that you faced during this time with, with building the brand? Was there something that was a real big hurdle for you to get through? Yeah, just um, just trying to live a life and be a person that I wasn't because I was so concerned about what people thought about me. You know what I mean? I was so hmm. focused on what was important to other people instead of being impactful in my own personal life, like in my household, you know, in my actual relationships, whether it be my marriage, you know, my, my, my relationships with my family and my close friends and stuff like that. And so for me, I, you know, you just have to step away. And early last year, I had to just like step away and kind of pull myself together. And I, and I talked about this in an Instagram post and, and I, I, I am going to take the time out to elaborate probably after the baby, but you know, like last year, I was just in a really bad place. You know, my husband and I had gotten separated. We had, you know what I mean? So it was all these things going on and it was really just because I was, I was putting everybody else, like my audience and my followers and what I thought people thought I should be over my actual real life. And I think that what happens is, you you know, we have to be really careful. Like social media is definitely part of my job. I'm on it every single day. But I think what we have to realize is that it doesn't define us. Like it's an extra fun thing that we get to do. You know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. And for me, that was what I, that's, that was what I had to go through um, to really learn and understand that. So I'm not really, while I, I do value my audience and, and I'm very thankful for the people who support me, um, what they always think about me isn't important. You know what I mean? My focus is how can I be impactful as a wife, as a mother, as a person contributing to this world versus how many likes can I get on on Instagram or anything like that. And, you know, this year has been probably the least visible I've been, I would say, within definitely since I've been full-time as a blogger, but it was easily the most profitable. I mean, I have easily doubled, and I, I, honestly, I, I probably have done more than that, but I've easily doubled my income within the last eight months. And it just proves that value and visibility is not sy- synonymous. Oh, you mentioned so much there, but there are two things I want to unpack is, oh, why is it really important for influencers, the people who are growing their influencership, to really take time for self-care? I, I, we have to be, we have to really, we really, I, we really undervalue ourselves as people, right? So I think that's the first thing. So once you like acknowledge that and know, like, because we, we keep on harping, the reason why we keep on harping on self-care, self-care is because we're not taking care of ourselves, you know? So that's why self-care has become so big, I think, as a, as a, a buzz topic within the last um, couple of years. But I think it's really important, like, you know, like, I can remember a couple of years ago, like, getting up, and, like, the first thing I do is check Instagram. The first thing I'm doing is checking Twitter. And there's something about just, like, starting your day with a whole bunch of strangers and a whole bunch of (laughs) spirits, if we're being honest, just, like, spewing a bunch of toxic language and energy, and that literally officially becoming, like, the theme of your day. Um, the What you consume in the first 15 minutes of your day becomes the official theme of your day. So I think we have to be really careful with that. I, quite frankly, at this point in my life, it cannot be what's on Instagram and what's on Twitter. It just can't be. Um, I And I think the other thing that's happening is that we keep on putting out work, 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 right? And we're not, and we keep on pouring into other people, which I think is a good thing, but I cannot pour into you until I pour into myself. So for me, that's prayer. For me, that's reading books that make me smarter, listening to podcasts that challenge me and different things like that. But a lot of us keep on trying to export all this information and content, and it's like you're not importing anything. You're not pouring anything into you. So it's like, 
how can you be consistent and put out quality work if you're not pouring into yourself quality information and content and 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 voices and and learning and getting smarter? Like if you're not getting smarter every day, what is the entire point? <laughs> you know, and you're yeah. not. Getting- Personally, for me, I don't get smarter every day when I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I don't. I'm not saying that there aren't things on there that can make you smarter, right? Because there's, you know, I think, like, I read most of my new stuff from, you know, publications on Twitter and stuff like that. But for the most part, a lot of us are just, like, interacting with our friends and followers and, like, laughing at memes and stuff like that, which I think there's always a time for. But it cannot be, like, the, it cannot be the, the fluent language of your everyday life. You know what I mean? That can get really, uh, I think that can get really toxic. I think you need to be really careful with that. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, I mean, there's so many things on Pinterest and so many things I've saved, like, via um, Twitter. I have, like, a whole DM uh, thread to myself with, like, articles that have made me smarter. But, yeah, I mean, but you can find a lot of other great things via <laughs> a book, a podcast, mm-hmm. um, you know what I mean? Talking to a family member who's older than you and had, and, and kind of lived and experienced things. So I think what it is, it is a delicate balance. I think it is about knowing like, that's not the only thing out there. You know, a lot of that for a lot of us, that's become the basis of like our life. Like, okay, well, was, what, what does Instagram think? Did people like this? You know what I mean? And a lot of us are so focused on like looking like we're living a life instead of actually living it. And it's fine to post pretty pictures. I live for a pretty picture. That's actually how I make my money. <laughs> so I'm all about <laughs> that. But again, I think we got to be careful and know that that's not the end all be all. So you also talked about um, how just focusing in really helped you double your, your revenue this this year. Um, can you tell our dream drivers just some easy tips or some, some really doable tips that, that we can use in our lives if we want to be more profitable with our brands, especially people who have online brands? Yeah. I mean, everything just needs a process and a system, everything, you know what I mean? And also be open to like changing that process and system. I don't think like that has to be the one thing for the rest of your life or your business or whatever have you. You know, I, I'm in the process of changing my editorial process um, just because we have a little bit more hands on deck and also because we're creating different types of content. So it's like I'm not only shooting outfit, shooting outfit posts anymore. Now we're doing lifestyle posts and food posts and family posts and different things like that. So you do have to change as you grow. I'm not, I'm 33 now, so I'm not wearing the same outfits and clothes that I was wearing when I was 23, <laughs> you know, like, because I change and I've grown and those things worked when I was 23. They're just, they just don't work for me now. So I think we just also have to be open to change and knowing that that's inevitable and not being afraid of that. But you do need a process and actually take the time to like time yourself doing something and then breaking down, breaking that down step by step. I think a lot of times we go into it with a plan and a plan is fine, but a plan is only part of it. You know what I'm plan you know, a plan is literally what you're trying to do, what it is you're trying to accomplish, which is great. Where are you trying to go? You know what I mean? Great. But I think the process is how you do that. Um, and then of course your strategy is why you do that. So for me, I think it's definitely hand in hand. It's like, okay, you want to post every day. Cool. There's fine. There's nothing wrong with posting every day. If you wanted to post Monday through Friday every single day, cool. But what is the point of that? You know what I mean? Like, why are you trying to do that? Why do you want, like a lot of people, we get really hung up on like, okay, I need more followers. I need more followers. And it's like, well, do you even know how to serve the 700 people who are serving you <laughs> while you're worried and trying to get 70,000? You know what I mean? Um, and you got to be clear. Like, why do you want, you know, I had that conversation with Maya the other day. You know, it's like, okay, this is how much money I want to make. So Maya of MayaElias.com is my my younger sister who's also an entrepreneur um, and an influencer. And, you know, we have these conversations all the time. It's like, you know, she's really great at processes and organizing and stuff like that. Um, I, I think my strength is definitely like um, coming up with new ideas and, and, and putting them out there and getting people excited about stuff. But I think for us, the conversations we have is like, oh my gosh, uh, this is a money goal I have, or I could t- I think I could totally do this. And it's like, this is great, but why? You know what I mean? Like, let's get to the bottom of this. Why do we want to do this? Let's make sure we're doing this from a place of from a place of excitement and and from a place of knowing that you're enough versus a place of like insecurity. You know what I mean? Which one of your revenue streams has been the most profitable for you once you made that switch? 
in 2017, my most profitable income stream has been working with brands. Um, I have never, in 2015, it was a real even balance of, um, it was a real even balance of both like courses, online courses, and working with brands. Uh, last year, it was definitely a little bit more on the course side. And this year um, was the first year that I surpassed um, six figures working with brands. But not only that, but like I've actually surpassed any six figure goal that I've ever had, you know, working with brands. So for me, it was really just like, Oh, and we just streamlined the process. You know what I mean? We um, got really clear on what we wanted my press kit to look like and what my rate sheet looked like and what we wanted that process to feel like. So it's like, before we even start discussing money, I get on the phone with a brand. Like I'm not just interested in you cutting a check. I'm interested in you caring about not only who I am as a creator, but my audience. Why do you want access to my audience? Let's have that discussion, you know, and are you in, are you just interested in cutting me a check so you can control everything I'm doing? So being really clear on why I create content for a brand was probably the biggest change I made as an influencer, for sure. And then, you know, also just having somebody specifically tag team with me in that, you know, so I don't, I'm self-managed, but for me, really streamlining the correspondence with my operations manager made a huge, huge difference that made sure we did not miss deadlines, that made sure we did not miss sending out invoices or getting checks on, on in, in a timely basis. Um, but it was because we went into that really, really intentional. We had a clear process and making sure we got like contracts countersigned before we even began work, making sure that all of those contracts were saved, making sure that, you know, our invoices look like this, making sure that people understood like what what I actually charge for something versus just coming to me and throwing me a number was also really important as well. So I think also, I think like I essentially was seen less, but made a lot more just because the things I did say yes to paid me a lot more because I was really clear on like, I'm really only interested in working with you because you actually care about my audience and you actually are aware of the kind of brand MaddieJames.com is. So I'm going to direct uh, our listeners to your podcast, to your blog, because you do like when I say that, Maddie. I know you had a you had a uh, a podcast about picking your brain, how to do it better, right? There, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. Maddie has a podcast, she has a blog post about it. So I will link to it instead of asking you right now. But the one thing I want to ask you though is, do you still think it's feasible for new like people who are new to the online space, creative entrepreneurs, to work with brands? Um, yeah, I absolutely think it's it's feasible for a new creator to do that. And I think it what it is is about building your um, arsenal, as I always like to tell new people. So it's like a lot of people are like, well, they didn't offer me any money. And it's like, well, girl, what have you done for some somebody <laughs> to give you money for that? You know what I mean? So it's really right. about building your content arsenal. So it's like, it's not only about doing, because I think a lot of people are like, well, I've had my blog for a year. And it's like, well, what kind of creon- content do you create well? So it's getting clear, like, do you do YouTube videos well? Do you do flat lays well? Do you do podcasts well? What do you do well that you could look somebody in the face and ask them for money and not blink twice? So I think it's about building that arsenal. So that is why in the beginning, I encourage people to post often and post consistently so you can get past that learning curve because that learning curve is inevitable. But I do think it's about building your content arsenal. So then that way you have reference content. So when somebody's like, oh, well, hey, um, do you work with brands? And what do you do if you do work for brands? You have a clear answer because you now have this reference arsenal, as I like to call it. Yes, that is so, so true. And what about... Um just figuring out relationships in the business as well. Cause I think, you know, working with brands isn't the only way for you, like working directly with brands, you also have to build relationships as well. How do you go mm-hmm. about building or starting the conversation so that you can eventually make the, make the pitch? I think it's just about really paying attention to like what brands are doing, like what new um, products do they have coming out? What um, collection are they pushing? How do they work with brands currently or how have they worked with brands in the past? You know, Um, I think that's really important. And I don't, here's the thing. I think like going to conferences and meeting these reps in person is huge, especially as a content creator, influencer, blogger. um, If you're in any of those kind of, uh, if, if any of those are your titles, right. But, but if you don't have the um, if you don't have the chance to meet them in person, which is huge, by the way, um, because when people meet you, they remember you, especially if they like you. And when people like you, they will always pay you. 
But Mm -hmm. I think also uh, if you do just make a cold pitch, it's just know exactly what you need to be pitching them and know what they're going to say yes to. You know, if you're pitching a brand who typically works with um, bloggers more so on just a product placement level and you're trying to pitch them this like elaborate campaign, then you're probably going to hear a no. But if you can pitch somebody and say, hey, I know that you guys work with bloggers in this capacity and I think I can really deliver some results for you, especially with the, the audience that I have, you're more likely at least to get the conversation going. Also, I'm always huge on like jumping on the phone with somebody, you know, um, especially since I, if I did not get the chance to meet you in person, like, hey, this is what I'm really thinking about hey, we'd love to work with you guys in this capacity and we'd love to jump on the phone with a for a really brief call just to explain in person and thoroughly what I had in mind and how this can be um, of some value to you. But don't be afraid to jump on the phone. I'll tell you what, I think out of, I think out of the 40 brand campaigns I've done this year, I've been on the phone with 37, I would say 36 to 37 of them. Wow. Were these people that you just like, that you cold, eat, cold pitch or these are people that, you knew already. Yeah, I would say out of the 40, I think I've pitched two. Um, But yeah, I I just get pitched on a regular basis. But I think we also are really intentional and strategic with that too. Like my email is available in every single social media bio. When you go to my site, um, I don't even think we have a contact form. It's just my direct email. Like I do not like the contact form is literally taking so much money out of people's pockets. People want to just directly email you and know that you're a real person and stuff like that. So we really do create um, an environment where people can find me and contact me and stuff like that. So, yeah. What would you say to the person who is listening to this podcast right now and just is feeling not confident about being able to implement any of this? Just to keep going, you know what I mean? Like, pull yourself out of the center. You're you're not the only one who's not getting a brand campaign right now. And I think that, know that in the beginning, it is going to take you doing the outreach, you know what I mean? And you doing the calling and you doing the re- re- reaching out just because the industry is also in the place where uh, there's a lot of this going on, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of influencers and, and, and bloggers, especially who either are full-time or want to be full-time. So if you want to be a part of that group, do the work that it takes to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Don't get discouraged. There's so many different opportunities and get used to hearing no, because it's going to happen all the time. (laughs) Get used to hearing (laughs) no. Um, And just like be loyal enough to yourself to like keep going and be patient and to do the work necessary and know that it's going to take longer than you think it is. But that doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. It just means that you need to give yourself more time. Yep. So what has been, what are your favorite business or, uh, favorite business resources that you would recommend for our creative and lifestyle entrepreneurs listening in? Things they need to be on right now. Um, I mean, if, if people don't use Asana, I, I, I definitely encourage them to, cause I think that definitely helped me get a lot more organized and streamline my processes. So, um, Asana is a project management system. Um, they have an app. They have a free option. So they do have like some paid plans, but their free plan is super great. Um, and it just allows you to set deadlines and even assign things if you're collaborating with people or you do happen to um, work with another person. Um, it's really, really great for that. But I love it because you can set your deadlines. You can write exactly what you want to accomplish. Like um, I think Asana is actually a really even great option for an editorial calendar as well. We're about to start using a system called Airtable that is just so fantastic. It's pretty much like this fluid and live um, spreadsheet that you can pretty much like put your idea in, what you want your link to be, what you want your header photo to be, when you want it published, who you want it to be you know, published by. Um, so it's really, really great. I'm super excited about Airtable. Uh, that's really going to be our editorial um, system um, as we go into 2018. But I think using those two things, I, I, I would I would be blown away, and I know I know they're out there. But if you're not using Google Drive, you definitely need to use yes. it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, Google Drive is just huge, and I think you absolutely need to use it. But yeah, I think those things, like the, I think the things I use every day is Google Drive, Dropbox, Asana, and as we're moving into 2018, I use Airtable to create our uh, editorial calendar. What keeps you going on those days that you feel like giving up, Maddie? Just the fact that I woke up and not like literally to like complain 
<laughs> like, like literally to complain about being like able-bodied and essentially getting paid to be myself is silly, you know? And, the, and I have those moments where you have to talk yourself out of bed. It's like, are you kidding me? Like you're getting annoyed because somebody's cutting you a check to do three Instagram posts, like get over yourself, you know? And, but I'm really blessed because I do have also a really strong support system. And so making sure that I, I keep, you know, like if I, if I do have an issue, I can take it to my husband or I can take it to my sister or my mom and, and them support me is really important, you know? Um, and I understand that everybody has that, but even if you have one person who does, um, affirm, you know, uh, affirm you and, and, and speaks life into what you're doing, keep them around and, um, don't take them for granted. You know what I mean? But you can do that yourself too. You know, even if you, if you're feeling good one day, write all the affirmations you need to write down on those days where you do feel bad, you can just, you have a place to go to and read that and, and feel encouraged again. So let's go into our lightning round, Maddie. At this point of our interview, I'm going to give you a prompt. And I want you to tell me the first word that comes to mind. And we're sticking with our whole dreams and drive metaphor. Okay? Okay. All right. The first word is part. I think it makes me think of still. Like, you know, like you, you got to, you need to be still. <laughs> That's what it makes me think of. You need to be still. Reverse. Um, looking the wrong way, you know, <laughs> looking the wrong way. <laughs> um, I, I think that. Well, I, yeah, I think, well, I'm sorry, not looking the wrong way, going the wrong way. I think sometimes you do have to look behind you to make sure um, that you are to kind of, one, see how far you've come and stuff like that. But I think you don't really need to reverse. You're going the right way. Figure it out. (laughs) Neutral. Um, Coasting. Dry. Um, Shore. (laughs) You know, like shore of where you're going. (laughs) And if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have your keys to success. So tell me three things that you think every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road. Um, definitely like a solid foundation. So um, in faith, in family, and and within yourself. So figure out what those things are for you. But like, you know, <laughs> your foundation please should not be based in, in, in social media. But yeah, you just need a solid foundation. Um, I think, too, you just need to be clear on your why. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, money is just not a good enough answer. Like, you want to make a living? Yes, that's all of us because at the end of the day, we need to eat, we need sleep, we need shelter and food and all of that. But why are you doing this? Why do you want to help the group of people you're helping? Get clear on what your why is. Get clear on what that – what is what – is, the purpose driving you, right, um, for the sake of the analogy. And then last but not least, I think you need to have fun. You know what I mean? If you're not enjoying it, it is going to be hard work because and it's going to be harder than what you thought it was supposed to be because it's supposed to. But you should be enjoying yourself along the way. You should be laughing at yourself, you know, falling flat on your face and having to get back up again. You know what I mean? Like, it's fine. You know, if something difficult happens, be able to laugh and not take yourself so seriously, you know, especially if you're trying to do something similar to me where I'm full-time blogging or, you know, creating, um, online courses and stuff like that. It's really, it's really not that deep. You know what I mean? We're not, (laughs) we're not curing cancer. So if you're, if you're not able to laugh at yourself and have a good time along the way, then you might want to step back and kind of reevaluate your why, right. And your why Mm -hmm. is definitely going to come from your foundation. Well, thank you so much, Maddie. This has been such a pleasure talking to you. And also congratulations. You are expecting baby number two. I didn't get to say that on the onset. But um, oh, thank you. Uh, wishing you a safe delivery. Um, can you tell our dream drivers where they can find you online if they want to learn more about you or consume all the great content that you put out? Um, you can follow me everywhere on social media at the Maddie James. So I'm the Maddie James on Twitter, Instagram, um, YouTube. But especially follow me on Instagram. I think you know I keep you guys in the loop the most there. Um, and then you, you guys can, of course, check out the site over at MaddieJames.com. And, of course, you can, if you guys just look up on iTunes, um, the Maddie James Show, you'll find my podcast there as well. Mm. And last question, Maddie. When you hear mm-hmm. the word dream driver, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Somebody who's willing to go get their dream. <laughs> and they're willing to drive to go get it. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem, Raina. Thank you. 
All right, so that was a wrap for episode 127 with Maddie James. I hope that you enjoyed hearing her dream driving journey as well as her keys to success. And if you liked that episode, the best thing you could do is screenshot it and share it with a friend. My favorite way for people to share is via Instagram stories. So if you love this episode, just screenshot it right now. Go to your Instagram stories and upload and tag us. We are Dreams and Drive and you can also use the hashtag Dreams and Drive as well if you want today's show notes because maddie had a lot of good tweetables a lot of good quotables they all can be found on the website just go to dreamsanddrive.com and then click on episode 127 remember we are at dreams and drive across the board facebook twitter and instagram so i really hope that you guys can go on and follow us and make sure we're connected and if you haven't joined our facebook group it's so easy all you have to do is just search dream driver mastermind the next time you're on facebook or you can just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash facebook and you can request access there as well you guys don't forget to enter our giveaway with yoga with kiara we are giving away either a got yoga crop top or a got yoga tank top just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win to enter that's dreamsanddrive.com slash win And if you haven't been following me on social or you're not part of our online newsletter, you may not know this, but we have Dreams and Drive merchandise for sale. So right now we are selling Dreams and Drive t-shirts and they're only $10 right now. So if you want to order a Dreams and Drive t-shirt, the easiest way to do so is just to email me, reina at dreamsanddrive.com or send me a message on Instagram at dreamsanddrive. And we have t-shirts in red, black, and gray available in sizes small to extra large. So if you want to order a shirt, that's the way to do it. Email me or send me a message on social. And I know, I know a lot of you might be like, why don't you have a shop set up? It's coming soon. I just wanted to test and validate some ideas, do some research before I actually just jumped into the online e-commerce world that way. So let's get to our listener of the week. So for the past few weeks, I have been reading reviews that you all have been leaving on Apple Podcasts. And of course, this week, I'm going to read another one. And this one is coming from Dina D57. And she says, hi, great podcast. I found out about you via Therapy for Black Girls, and I've been listening ever since. Thank you so much, Dina. And thank you so much to Joy of Therapy for Black Girls. A few weeks ago, we did a podcast ad swap. So I did a ad on her podcast and she did an ad on my podcast and it has just been so incredible to do that and I've just been so thankful for everyone who has come over from Therapy for Black Girls so thank you, thank you, thank you Joy and if you guys have not heard Therapy for Black Girls, you definitely need to go search it and subscribe today and thank you to everyone who has signed up for my podcast coaching sessions. I'm so thankful that, you know, every week I'm getting people who are interested in working with me one on one and building their podcast or just getting feedback on how they can take their podcast to the next level. If you want to work with me, and you want to learn more about the, the coaching sessions. Basically, you get a one hour coaching session with me and then after that I'm going to give you a complete audit of one of your episodes and really give you tips from what I think you can do in order to build your podcast and take it to the next level to book a session or to learn more just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash session that's dreamsanddrive.com slash session and also you get some freebies there I won't give it away here but you got to go to the um to the page to see what those freebies are And next week's episode is going to be with Sarah Kunst, and it's going to be amazing. She's a former VC turned entrepreneur, and she now runs the company Pro Day. So we're going to hear about her story and how she ended up as a black woman in the VC world and how she navigated that and all the lessons she's learned. So definitely, definitely get pumped for that one. Keep dreaming, keep driving, and we'll chat again in episode 128. Bye, guys.